The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. As Christmas Day draws near, every father becomes more deeply aware of how much his wife and family mean to him. For this is the season when we think of others, when we find our greatest happiness in promoting the happiness of those we love. Perhaps that is why more fathers choose December than any other month to increase their family's protection with the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Yes, this is a good time to get in touch with your Equitable Society representative to discuss with him the finest gift that any man can give his loved ones, security through life insurance. Tonight's FBI file, Operation Rumba. Tonight, your FBI removes the secret classification from another of wartime files and makes public this story of how one of its special agents aided the Allied cause in the fight against the Axis. The time of this case was December 1942, almost four years ago to the day, a period which saw headlines about strange remote places like Guadalcanal, Tunis, Mature, Bazerte. They were the days of desperation, when it seemed, even to those who are not faint-hearted, that victory for the Axis might be just around the corner. Tonight's file opens on a street corner in a large city in South America. A middle-aged lady, limping quite badly, approaches the corner where George Harrison, a young American chemist, is standing. The middle-aged lady speaks. I beg your pardon, young man. No, uh, are you talking to me? Yes. I'd like you to do me a favor. If I can. I wonder if you'd wait here with me until the traffic slows down and help me across. Well, certainly. Thank you so much. You're an American, aren't you? Yes. That's why I asked you. Some of these natives down here hate us so much, I'd be afraid they'd push me in front of a car. Oh, they're not that bad. Oh, wait till you've been here as long as I have. Well, I think they're good ones. There are some... very few good ones, young man. You can take my word for that. Besides, they're almost all German spies. I wouldn't trust any of them. Well, I don't know about that. Well, you'll find out that I'm right, young man. And I hope you do before it's too late. Well, I hope so, too. I, I think we can get across after this car passes, ma'am. Yes, I believe you're right. Do you mind if I take your arm? Not at all. Wagner. Hurry, get in. That was a fine push you gave him. At first, I didn't think I'd pushed him hard enough to get him in front of that other car. It was perfect. In fact, I think the car that Pedro was driving, she killed the young man. Oh, that's too bad. He was a nice boy. But we can't worry about him now. Let's hurry. I've got to get this briefcase to the pet shop. A few hours later in the hospital room of George Harrison, George was explaining his strange accident to Special Agent Jim Taylor. You say this woman was about 45 with dark hair and a light complexion. Yes, Mr. Taylor, that's right. And when she approached you, she was limping quite badly. She was. Well, if the woman purposely pushed you in front of the car to get your briefcase, as you seem to think, then in all probability is, and, well, that limp was fake. I suppose you're right. And you have no idea what happened to the woman? None. 
What makes you think she pushed you as this car was approaching? Well, the car just seemed to come out of nowhere, and it seemed to me she stepped back and pushed me right in front of her. Hmm. Can you describe the briefcase you say she took, Mr. Harrison? Well, it was an ordinary brown calfskin briefcase with my initials, G.H.A. Mr. Harrison, I happen to know that you're down here working on an important secret project, and that this may be a conspiracy, but... But what? But there must be a lot of women in this city who answer to the description that you've give, give, given me. Shouldn't be too hard to find her. Still, if we find her and she hasn't got the briefcase. What do you mean? I mean, what do we do then? There's no way you can prove that she actually pushed you, is there? You're not even sure she did. Well, I see what you mean. However, we'll go to work on it, Mr. Harrison. And the first break we get, we'll let you know. Out at the pet shop, Mrs. Wagner. Good. I won't be too long. Do you want me to wait for you? Yes, wait right here. Good morning, Alex. Ah, good morning. You have the briefcase. Yes, it worked perfectly. Here. But it was very lucky there wasn't anyone in the pet shop when I walked through. Oh, that does not matter. Whatever there are customers, when you come in, just wait. Jose will get rid of them, and then you can walk back here in safety. Oh, yes, I see. You like the canaries in the shop? Why, yes. They're new, aren't they? We just got them in yesterday. But what do you do with canaries? They aren't rare. No. But Jose was complaining. He said the radio transmitter was making so much noise you could hear it all over. Now they will think it is the canary. Why, how clever. That's a wonderful trick. <laughs> To be in this business and to stay in this business, I must use your head. Ah, there. Now, let me see what we have here. Ah. Huh. Ah. Ah. Mrs. Wagner, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. Sorry to tell me what? This briefcase does not contain the right information. What? Yes, I'm sorry. For this, we cannot pay you. You understand that, no? But I took great chances this morning, Alex. I know, I know. But, Mrs. Wagner, I can only buy from you what I can get paid for. Now, if you wish to undertake another assignment... Well, I need the money, Alex. I've told you that. Very well. Listen carefully. I want you to go back. Come in. Hello, Mr. Harrison. Well, hello. It's so good to see that you weren't hurt badly either. Oh? My doctor examined me and said I was only slightly bruised. So I came to see how you were and to return your briefcase. But how did you know who I was and where I was? Why, there was a story about the accident in the morning paper in which it said you'd been brought to this hospital. Oh, I see. Well... Thank you for returning the briefcase. Well, it's nothing, really. It was very nice of you, and I do appreciate it. Uh, how long are you going to be here? Well, I'm going to be released tomorrow. Splendid. Then I'm not going to leave this hospital room until you tell me what day you're coming to my home for tea. Well, I'm a... Now, after all, I feel I'm partly responsible for your having met with this accident. Now, you must say yes, Mr. Harrison. Well, I'll be pretty busy the first day I get out of here, but... Well, how, how about Thursday, then? That, that sounds all right. Uh, what's your address, Mrs. Wagner? 17 Avenue of the Siestas. Isn't that romantic? Very. All right, then I'll see you on Thursday at, uh, say, five. That's wonderful. I'll be waiting. May I come in, Senor Montes? Yes, yes, come in, please. What is it I can do for you? Here are my credentials, Senor. James Pilder. Oh, please sit down, Mr. Taylor. We're very happy to do what we can to cooperate with the American FBI. Uh, thank you, Senor Montes. What can we do? Our censors in the United States intercepted the letter with secret writing on it that was sent to a man here named Rafael Torres. Rafael Torres. I don't know that name, Mr. Taylor. You think he's a German spy? We are pretty sure he is, judging from what was in this letter to him. Where did they send that letter to Senor Torres? 
It was addressed to him at 43 Avenue Dos Picos. 43 Avenue Dos Picos. I went by there this morning. It's a pet shop. Oh, yes. That is owned by a man named Jose Condado. Do you know him? Not too well, but he runs a big business. He sells many rare birds. He has a boat which he sends up the river for those birds. Do you know the name of the boat, Senor Montes? El Aguila. That means the eagle in Spanish. Yes, I know. I speak a little Spanish. Good. Now, um, what else do you want to know? Well, according to your records and our own, there isn't a transmitter in this country sending out a signal powerful enough to be picked up overseas. That is correct. We have been very careful about that. Yes, I know that. Oh, what puzzles me is, if they're not using the radio, how are they getting that information out? That I do not know. But if there is anything I can do to help you to find out... Well, I'll tell you what you can do for us, if you will. Yes? You can put a plain clothesman on watch at the pet shop. Maybe we can pick up something by watching who goes out and who comes mm-hmm. in. Maybe. Hey, excuse me. I'll certainly... Chief of Police Montes. Yes, Mr. Taylor, it's here. Just a minute, please. It's your office. Oh, thank you, sir. Hello. Oh, yes, Don. Harrison called, you said? Said that woman was all right and returned the briefcase, huh? I see. Okay, Don, I'll see you later. Now, Senor Montes. Well, as you were requesting, Mr. Taylor, we should be glad to put a man on watch at the pet shop, and we shall give you a report. Thank you, Senor Montes. And as soon as I find out anything, I'll be in touch with you. Is this the residence of Mrs. Nora Wagner? Yes, sir. I am Alec, Mrs. Wagner's butler, sir. Are you Mr. Harrison? Yes, I had an appointment with Mrs. Wagner. She's expecting you, sir. Please go straight ahead. Thank you, Alec. Hello there, Mr. Harrison. Good afternoon, Mrs. Wagner. Well, you look fine. No ill effects from the accident? No, the doctor said there wasn't a single after effect. <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> Now, would you like some tea, or would you rather have whiskey? Oh, uh, tea would be fine. I've got to get back to the office after I leave here to finish up some work. All right. We'll both have tea, then. Mm-hmm. Uh, will you have a cigarette, Mrs. Wagner? Oh, no, thank you. I smoke a special brand. Alex cigarette. There you are, madam. Well, here, uh, let me light it for you. Thank you. Uh, I think the time is time to tell you something, Mr. Harrison. What's that? Mr. Harrison, we know you're a chemist and that you were sent down here to work on synthetic rubber. But, uh... Now we want to know the results of your most recent experiment with butadine. It's as simple as that. But if I refuse to tell you? Alex? This is what will happen. <laughs> Now get up and start talking. I'll tell you what I'll do. You do it! Alex? Are you sure you didn't hit him too hard that time? No, he isn't hurt. He'll just be unconscious for a little while. Well, you'd better take him up to the bedroom. Yes. And when he comes to, if he still refuses to talk, then I can go to work on him again. Turn in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now, a word to fathers about security for the family. Father, do you have the courage to face some facts which may give you a real jolt? If you haven't got that courage, better turn off your radio for the next 59 seconds, because here comes a question which is very likely to open your eyes to a serious situation. You're still listening? Then you do have the courage. All right. Ask yourself this question. If I should die, how would my family get through the critical years until the youngest child finished high school? How long would my wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? That deserves more than a superficial offhand answer. It deserves a thoughtful answer based on facts. To help you get them... The Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers, which has these three advantages. First, it's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. 
Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Say, hey, that's something that not one father in a hundred knows. Where do I get one of these fact-facing charts? And how much does it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. It is unfortunate but true that during a war when emotion runs high and patriotism is a word with dignity, that there are some who place their personal comforts before the welfare of the nation. The list of traitors to every nation is a long one and is studded with those who are traitors in time of peace as well as in time of war, traitors to their own country and to the human race. For what they have to sell is not disloyalty, but hate. In time of war, they're called traitors. In time of peace, they're dismissed as harmless crackpots. But what they have to sell is dangerous at any time. For hate breeds hate. And when the world's quotient of hatred exceeds the world's quotient of friendship, then we shall know the terrible tragedy of World War III. Tonight's file continues at police headquarters where Special Agent Jim Taylor has just entered into a conference with Chief of Police, Carlos Montes. You think you have uncovered something, Jim? I don't know, Carlos, but I was down at the pier this morning when the El Aguila came in and there was a coat of salt on the prow. So? That coat of salt means that that ship was out on the ocean, Carlos. Yes, you're right. Where do you think the boat went? I don't know, but they've got a radio on that boat. Do you know anything about it? Yes, all radios and boats that ship out of this harbor are registered here, Jim. Oh? In that green book over there. Well, let's look up the radio on the El Aguila. Um, here we are. El Aguila. Mm. No, Jim, this radio, she isn't strong enough to send more than two, three hundred miles. Yes, you're right. That's only a ship to shore, 50 water. Now I am puzzled. I do not understand this whole thing. You mean about the boat? Yes. I have known Jose Condado for several years, and I know he is not the kind of a man who would work with Germans. Then he doesn't know what's going on under his nose, Carlos, because we know his pet shop is a mail drop. Still, no one we have not been able to identify has gone into the pet shop since we put a man on watch. Well, I don't know the answer, Carlos, but I... Excuse me. Oh, certainly. Chief of Police Montes. Yes, Mr. Taylor is here. Just a minute, please. It's for you, Jim. Thanks. Hello. Yes, Don. What? George Harrison has disappeared. Don. Don, do you know where his office is? Where? Wait a minute. Let me copy that down. Okay. Okay, I got it. Let's take a look around his office. I'll meet you there in ten minutes. come to yet, Alex? Yes, he came to her, and he wouldn't talk. So you went to work on him again? Naturally. Let me try for a while. <laughs> come on. Come on. <sighs> Alex. Yes? Get me a drink of that brandy. Maybe that'll help. All right. Here. Thank you. Here. Take a drink of this. Drink it. It's good for you. I think you will talk now. You're at my home, Mrs. Wagner. Remember? What were the results of your experiments? No. No, I won't tell you. You take him, Alex. Go to work on him. 
I don't think I'll work on him anymore. Why not? Because he will not talk to us. He will not tell us anything. What are we going to do then? Let him go? No, we will not let him go, but I will call the pet shop. What do you want from the pet shop? A truck. We will take Mr. Harrison down to the El Aguila. What can you do with him on the boat? The El Aguila will make a rendezvous at sea with one of our U-boats. And when they get Mr. Harrison in Germany, they will know how to make him talk. <laughs> Can that be? I don't know. But you had better answer the door. You think it's the truck from the pet shop? No, the truck will come to the back door, I told him. Oh, all right. I'll go. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Mrs. Wagner? Yes. Oh, is Mr. George Harrison still here? Uh, no, I'm sorry, but he isn't. I had an appointment with Mr. Harrison for this afternoon, but he didn't keep it. I see. Oh, George is a friend of mine. I have a message for him. He told you he was coming here for tea? No, I found that out from his appointment pad at his office. Oh, I see. Well, if you hear from him, Mrs. Wagner... I'll have him get in touch with you, Mr... Uh, Taylor, Jim Taylor. I'll tell him to get in touch with you, Mr. Taylor. He knows where to call you, does he? Yes, he does. And, uh, Mr. Taylor. Oh, yes? If you hear from him first, I wish you'd ask him to get in touch with me and explain his not making an appearance. Yes, I'll do that. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Goodbye, Mrs. Wagner. Who was that? Someone looking for Harrison. Looking for? How did they know he was here? Harrison had my name on his appointment pad in his office. All right, then we must hurry. Is the truck here yet? Yes, while you were talking, I saw the truck enter your garage. Come on, give me a hand. What do you want me to do, help you carry him? No, he's not unconscious. I've been tied up and gagged, and I will keep him covered with my gun until we get to the boat. Well, let's get to work. <laughs> Carlos? Jim. Carlos, we've got to get moving. What is it, Jim? I went to Harrison's office and found out that he was at Mrs. Wagner's for tea this afternoon. Yes? I went there and Mrs. Wagner said that Harrison had never arrived. You saw him there? No, but I know he was there. How? Well, you know how light it is out this evening. Yes? I saw a thread of fresh footprints on Mrs. Wagner's doorsteps. Yes? Heel prints were very clear. They were made by rubber heels that are sold only in the United States. I see. You want to go back and search the house? No, I looked around and back of the house after I left. And I saw the pet shop truck in the garage. What? Yes, they're probably moving Harrison somewhere right now. Well, what do you want to do, Jim? I want you to go down to the El Aguila with me. And we'll have to hurry. I hope we're in time. So do I, for Harrison's sake. I don't understand about that Jose Candado. I I'm sure... More time, Carlos. I found you can't be sure of anyone. No, I suppose you're right. That is El Aguila down there. Oh, good. All right, Carlos. Let's stop about a half a block away. Good. Now let's get out of the car and sneak down there, just so we'll be close enough in case we have to go into action. All right. Is that the truck coming down here? Yes, that looks like it. Come on, I'll stuck in here. That's it, Carlos. The truck is stopping in front of the boat. Yes, I see. See that woman getting out, you see? Yes. That's Mrs. Wagner. Who is that man with her? You know him? I can't tell from here. They're going around to the back of the truck. Yes, I see. Someone else is coming out of the back of the truck. I recognize that build. Carlos, it's Harrison. Let's get him. Let's go. Stop in the name of the law. Run, both of you. You got him, Carlos. Well, good evening, Mrs. Wagner. Do you mind if I remove the gag from Mr. Harrison's mouth? He... That man you shot, he forced me to help him. You'll know all about that in a minute. As soon as I untie the knot. There. Oh. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. You got here just in time. Mr. Harrison, tell these men that I was forced into this. You heard that man threaten me. I heard you threaten him, Mrs. Wagner. What? Yes, I heard you say that unless you got your money tonight, you were going to make trouble. 
You said that you had delivered me, and that was your part of the bargain. So that's why you came down to the boat, Mrs. Wagner, to get paid. I wondered about that. Uh, Mr. Harrison, perhaps you can tell me something. What is it? You heard them speak of a Jose Condaro? I heard Alex, uh, the man here you just shot, say that Condaro was forced to work with him because the Germans kidnapped his mother and were holding her as a threat. Uh-huh. Well, Mrs. Wagner? I won't say another word. I want to get a lawyer. That's fair enough. And I've got a tip for you. You have? Yes. With Harrison here alive to tell his story, you'd better get a good lawyer. A very good one. Nora Wagner was found to be a German national, was tried and convicted of felonious assault, and was sentenced to be deported to Germany at the end of the war. That sentence has been carried out. And so another wartime file was closed by your FBI. Closed successfully because of the alert work of a special agent and the fine cooperation of the local police in South America. Also closed was the file on who wrote the original letter from the United States, the letter that was intercepted. That person's home was raided. One of the 25,881 raids made by your FBI during the war. Because of those raids, and because of the cooperation it received from local police all over the Americas, your FBI was proud to report at the end of the war that there had not been one single successful attempt at sabotage. That is a record of which your FBI is very proud. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school, years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Rendezvous in the Everglades. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweet. The music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Rendezvous in the Everglades on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.